Hello, I'm Dr. John Swalik, President of Obanzi Community College. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's teleclass. As part of our mission to serve the college's diverse population, we are continually striving to make our courses, classes, and services as accessible as possible. In January 1996, the College Board of Trustees approved the formation of a new unit of the college, the Distance Learning Institute. The primary goal of this institute is to help the college make the most effective use of current distance learning methods while exploring the potential of new technologies which may be applied to the distance learning environment. As new methods of technology shorten the distance between the instructor and the student, the entire state and even the nation will become a service district of literally a college without walls. We believe one way in which we can best serve students' needs is through the provision of live interactive courses such as today's teleclass offered through our interpreter training department. I'd like to ask Mary Wright, the manager of our interpreter training project, to introduce our distinguished panel members. Thank you, Dr. Swalik. On behalf of our administration, staff, and faculty, as well as co-sponsors, I am delighted to welcome you to our sixth international teleclass, Enhancing Racial and Ethnic Diversity in the Interpreting Profession. Our topic is one that has been chosen based on a growing need and interest for training in the area of racial and cultural diversity. An overall goal of today's class is to help prepare our students, faculty members, and working interpreters to be more responsive and sensitive to the needs of consumers of color, those who are from culturally diverse racial or ethnic backgrounds. We are privileged to have as our speaker today Dr. Glenn Anderson. Glenn is currently the Director of Training at the University of Arkansas Rehabilitation Research and Training Center for persons who are deaf or hard of hearing. Joining Dr. Anderson on the panel today is Fidel Martinez. Fidel is a rehabilitation counselor for the Illinois Department of Rehabilitation Services. I'm also pleased to welcome Jan Nishimura, Vice President and Co-Founder of Sign Language Associates, and Jonathan Hopkins. Jonathan is an interpreter and instructor at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Mary Mooney is also with us this afternoon. She is currently the director of the National Multicultural Interpreter Project at El Paso Community College. It is an honor to have all of you as our guests. I'd like to ask Dr. Anderson to begin with an introduction to today's topic. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our teleclass program. I'd like to provide you with a brief background about myself. I'm a native Chicago, uh, Illinois, growing up in the hood and south side of Chicago. I went to the Chicago, through the Chicago public school system in an oral day program. I decided to choose my high school on the basis of geographic location. I was not willing to make a long trip to the other side of the city by bus. So I chose a high school that was within an hour of my home rather than two hours. Then at that time, I did not know about Gallaudet University, so I went to Northern Illinois University. And there I encountered for the first time serious discrimination. I was in a situation where I was not permitted to enter the dorm. I was informed that they were full. I got an approved university housing list, which included going to a neighboring town and finding that the housing was actually on the other side of the railroad tracks in a small black community. That was a new experience for me. And then while there in the program, I was informed that I would have to transfer out of that particular program because the professor did not feel I was qualified in order to, uh, to be able to get a C in a speech course, which I had not yet taken. I was sent to many different advisors, so to speak. 
hoping that they would be able to advise me out of the college. But I was stubborn. I went to each one of them. There were a lot of different people. And finally, the last one told me, have you heard about Gallaudet University? That person could sign and was a great help to me to transfer to, the, to Gallaudet University. When I graduated, I had a choice of entering graduate school at the University of Arizona or going to work in Ohio, a service program. My parents and I discussed it, and I told them that my preference was to go to work. And the reason, of course, was to earn income. I wanted to buy a car, some nice clothes. I wanted a party. I wanted my own place. My father, you know, the wise man, I told him, you know, I'm tired of not having any money. It's an opportunity to make some money now. I'll go to school later. And my dad listened. And he took the long view. I had the short view. My dad encouraged me to go on to the University of Arizona. Go to school while you have the opportunity. Don't postpone it. So I did. I went to the University of Arizona Graduate School. And there for the first time, I was in a situation where I had interpreters in my classroom. My interpreter happened to be Japanese American, raised with deaf brothers and sisters. That was a new experience for me, to have an interpreter within the classroom. It was the first time that I heard the word, which I had not heard before. People are saying, gringo. Gringo? What was that? a Mexican word for white man. That was a new experience. And then other words like barrio. I said, what's that? Again, another new term. And that meant a part of a Mexican community. And again, that was my first experience with an interpreter within the classroom. Now, just briefly, telling you, uh, sharing with you my community involvement. I'm vice president of the Little Rock chapter of the Black Deaf Advocates. Newsletter, editor of the Association for the Deaf in Arkansas. Chairman of the board at Gallaudet University. And over 23 years, I played basketball for six different deaf clubs. I want to share with you something I've noticed about the deaf community. I've been in the profession for over 25 years. I've seen a lot of deaf communities throughout the United States, and I've seen some changes. Uh, it's becoming more diverse. More people from other parts of the world are moving into the United States. The cultural diverse community is expanding within the deaf community as well. More people are expressing pride in their ethnic and racial heritage. I've heard friends now saying, I don't want to park my culture at the front door when I go to work. And I've noticed, oh, over the last several years, We've had more organizations of people of color being formed and established. The BDA was established in 82. And within the last six years, the National Hispanic Council for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing has been formed. The IDC, Intertribal Deaf Council. And then uh, next year, 1997, the Asian American Deaf Community will be hosting their second national conference. At the same time, our interpreting profession is not as diverse, which means that many of our professional interpreters encounter situations where they are working with people who have cultural backgrounds different from their own. 
there is there are more chances for cultural clashes now. What this means, I believe, is that it's now more important than ever for interpreters to be able to establish productive working relationships with people who are different from themselves. And this means interpreters need to improve and expand their cultural skills. Many people who are involved with diversity training say that people going through a five-step learning process learn multicultural skills. And I'd like to share those five steps with you at this time. The first step is becoming aware of culture and its influence. The second step is learning about our own culture. Third is learning about your own ethnicity and how you stereotype and judge and how that influences your emotional reactions to conflicting cultural values. The fourth step is learning about other cultures. The fifth and final step is building, practicing, and applying new communication and interaction skills. People involved with diversity training like to use the iceberg as an analogy when talking about culture. You can imagine out on the ocean a ship sailing along and often they do not see the iceberg. That's one of the reasons for shipwrecks. Most of the time, a very small portion of the iceberg is seen above the surface of the ocean. Most of that iceberg is below the surface. In talking about culture, we see the same thing. We can observe people, the way they dress, the way they interact, the foods they eat. Those would be things that are observable in everyday situations that's on the surface. And that might be about 10% of what the actual culture comprises. The culture that we don't see is below the surface. And again, that's approximately the remaining 90% of the culture. That might include values and beliefs. Decisions and actions of pe that, uh, that people make 
The reasons they do that we don't see. So often when two different cultures come together, a working relationship, sometimes you have those, quote, shipwrecks, end of quote. When we're not familiar with that person's culture, their values, and their beliefs, the way they make decisions, the actions they take, we haven't learned about it because we can't see it. So that's the main purpose of this afternoon's program. We want to talk about culture of four different important groups of deaf and hard of hearing people that, deaf, that interpreters will be working with. We hope by sharing the hidden parts of the culture. This will be a beginning process and will help make it possible to reduce the number of those shipwrecks that interpreters encounter on a daily basis on their job. We'll be talking about these four groups, the African American, the Hispanic, the Asian, and the Native American. I will begin by talking about the African American deaf community. There are several ways that black deaf people identify themselves. When using the English language, terms such as African, African American, Black, West Indies, biracial, and many other terms are used by black deaf people to identify themselves. I remember one time when I was at Gallaudet University a few years ago, I was on a panel and a person from the audience asked a question saying, I'm confused and I want to know what is the appropriate term to use when talking with black people. The reason I'm confused, he went on to say, is because that I have black people telling me that I'm African American, not black. And others saying, I'm black, not Afro-American. Or I'm a person of color. So the person asked me, which of these terms are appropriate? Now most black Deaf people are multicultural. They have a number of heritages in their background, such as African, American, and Deaf. Therefore, all the terms are appropriate. It really depends on how that individual chooses to identify him or herself. When using American Sign Language, you will see signs like this, African American around the face, or the one that's in a neutral space, and some use the sign for black. You, notices, you notice that there are differences in the sign usage for African American. Now why are these differences in the signs? I would like to share with you two perspectives on this. The first perspective would be from the American deaf community. That sign was developed not that long ago by an American deaf people. And it was intended to represent the shape of the continent of Africa. And that sign has appeared now in many different public situations, used by interpreters and by some of the deaf people who have seen this. And basically, people have adopted the neutral sign for Africa throughout the community. That's one perspective. 
there is another perspective from African deaf people. Many of them moving to the United States encounter people who sign using this one for Africa, which is very different from the sign that they themselves use, such as this one around the face. And their reasoning is, on the basis of history, we view Africa as the origin of civilization. Therefore, it's natural to consider Africa to be the mother of civilization, and many African deaf people use the face in the sign to represent a profile of a woman. Woman being a symbol of the mother of civilization. And then they're using that, this profile as a way to locate different countries within the African continent. For example, Senegal is pinpointed at the upper lip. Nigeria, under the chin on the neck. South Africa, at the base of the neck. And again, that's for location purposes. Many deaf people in Africa have very specific signs that are indigenous to their own country. How can we decide which sign is the right one? Well, I think it would be best for interpreters, interpreting students, professors, to get together and review an article that was published in this March of 1994 in the Silent News entitled, A Sign for Africa American Pride, which is on page three. It would also be a good idea to ask the black deaf community and get their views. Talk with deaf people from Africa, get their views, and then on that basis, decide which sign is appropriate to use. Now, my personal preference is to use this sign around the face for African American, and that's simply because I think we should follow the same procedure we use for adopting signs that are used by deaf people for their own countries in the international community. I want to talk about specific cultural knowledge at this point that interpreters need to know to be effective in working with the black deaf community. Last month in El Paso, the National Minority Interpreting Interpreter Project, directed by Mary Mooney, who's here today as one of the panel members, a number of us met representing different cultures. We discussed the needs for a curriculum and for materials that can be used by interpreter programs to teach cultural diversity. Our African American work team talked about what it is that interpreters need to know about the African American community to be effective. And we came up with three areas at this time. The first one, cultural knowledge, which includes values and beliefs. The second one is communication styles and language use. And the third one, informal unspoken rules and social taboos. I want to briefly touch on each of these three areas. First, let's talk about the cultural styles and language use within the deaf community, the black deaf community. 
community has a particular style that relates to its culture. The black community has a particular style and a way of communicating as well. It's a language that has been developed through the history of oppression in this country of America. It's a very lively, particularly exciting, creative, colorful language. And many, many black people use the language, and many black deaf people also use this language. I think it is important that interpreters be familiar with that language usage, because it's going to appear quite often in daily uh, life of the black deaf people. Our labels for language for our purposes today, we'll call it Black English. Black English, as I said before, most black people are familiar with this language, and its roots are in the African-American experience, and also come from the oral tradition which is embedded within that Afri African-American experience. The oral tradition includes old sayings, proverbs, stories that have been passed on from one generation to another. Many black people have grown up hearing all these things through the oral tradition. Black English is a very valuable part of that, and it reflects cultural beliefs and values. Some of the unique aspects of black English includes one process that black people use called semantic inversion process. Taking a positive word, I'm sorry, taking a negative word and giving it a positive meaning. For example, in the hip hop, a 1990s version of black English, in hip hop, the word fat, F A T, is spelled. P-H-A-T. And that word reflects a cultural value within the black community. It reflects that which is good, excellent, people who are a little bit large, got large hips and legs, have body weight as opposed to the value, perhaps, in another culture where people prefer thin, diet lot, and so forth, as opposed to being heavier. So then you take also the word, for example, bad. It reminded me of a commercial I saw a few years ago, a Kentucky Fried Chicken commercial, where there were two black men sitting at a table really enjoying their chicken. And they're saying, oh, this chicken's bad. And the other guy says, yeah, this chicken is bad. And then there's a white customer sitting at another table looking quite confused, <laughs> wondering, what's wrong with the chicken? Why are they saying it's bad? Also, regardless of the type of jobs or where the person lives, social class, religious beliefs, whatever, most black people tend to get their hair done, 
Are there haircuts in black barber shops? Worship at black churches? Party together? So the language and the culture is continually used within the black community no matter what their background of social class or economic status. This spills over into the black deaf community. They pick up the vocabulary and the language usage because of their interaction with their peers. I've had many of my friends, deaf friends, stop by my house and I invite them in and they'll say, hi, I thought I'd stop by and holler at you. Or another might say, hey, bro, can I cop a five from you? I've gone to parties and I have friends say, see you later. I see a fine fox I want to hit on. And deaf black people are using this language as well. Within the oral tradition, proverbs and old sayings reflect black cultural values. They talk about the way of life, how to succeed, in spite of the problems that people face. Words of wisdom are shared. And I think many of the sayings are certain uses of black English. I'd like to share with you some examples at this time. A hard head makes a soft behind. You don't get to be old being no fool. Many people know how to criticize, but few know how to praise. Opportunity does not send letters of introduction. Positive anything is better than negative nothing. It's pretty hard for the Lord to guide you if you haven't made up your mind which way you want to go. The next area I'd like to talk about is informal, unspoken rules, and social taboos. When our African-American team met together in El Paso last month, we talked about the informal, unspoken rules and social taboos, and we recognized that it is an important area. But we still need to spend more time developing this area more fully. So I only have a few examples to share with you today. The first involves the use of in-group words and expressions. An interpreter could be in a predominant, predominantly black situation, and black people will use the words such as nigger or negro or colored people. That's part of the in-group identity that they share among themselves. We recommend that the interpreter, if they're not from that culture, should not use the ASL signs for those terms. It would be better to fingerspell those terms. The second would be from time to time, an interpreter might be 
voicing for a black deaf presenter. Many black deaf people have a unique communication style incorporating black English, reflecting black values and culture. If the interpreter is not from the culture, then it's going to be difficult for that interpreter to step out of character and try to sound black. We recommend that the interpreter be natural, comfortable in how they sign or how they voice. I've had a situation where a friend has approached me, a white friend, and tried to talk black. He walked and says, yo, bro, what's up? What's happening? And tried to do the, you know, the hand shake that we use and all kinds of mistakes occur. It's better off staying natural. A third example relates to interpreters in a black social event. And interpreters often might be in a situation where many black people are using cultural attire. And the interpreter might be tempted to fit in by trying to dress black, wearing maybe loud colored clothing, you know, or an African costume or outfit. But it's not really natural for them. And so we recommend that the interpreter be natural and comfortable, dress professionally and appropriate without trying to, quote, dress black. One more area that I'd like to go to relates to communication style that's used in the black community. It is something that we see in formal situations as well as informal situations. A formal situation you may consider as a church or lectures, a community program. The informal would be at the basketball court perhaps, a street corner. And this is where the particular communication style is called the call response. Then you see this quite often in the black church where the speaker is giving his speech, makes the call, and the audience, the listeners, respond. It's a very lively exchange. And it's an important aspect of the value, reflecting the values of the black community where it's important to get feedback, a response from your audience. The only wrong response in that setting is no response. Now in another culture, their values are different and their preference is not to interrupt the speaker. But in the call response style, it is very important to holler out yes or go on. Even a nonverbal movement of the hand showing agreement, support. The best example of this is the I Have a Dream speech by Dr. Martin Luther King. A fabulous example of the call response style. Now, the last thing I'd like to do is to share two personal experiences relating to the use of interpreters. The first one happened when I was invited 
to a day school program in New Jersey, and I was to speak to the deaf students on graduation day. I met with the interpreter ahead of time, and we talked, and she asked me about my speech, and I explained, and then she said, do you plan to use any signs that I need to be aware of? And I said, well, yes, there is one. At that time, in the community, we were using this sign to refer to African. Came, you know, came off the sign of black. This was in the early 1970s. So the interpreter said, oh, well, uh, I would prefer that you not use that sign. I said, why not? And she said, well, because we've been teaching our students the months of the year, and that's the sign that we come up with for August. Well, that was a new one on me. The second experience I'd like to share with you is a, a multi, multicultural experience that I had in New York. I was working in a community college program. We received a call from a local agency. They had two deaf people from Russia who had just recently moved to New York. They wanted to come to our program to acquire English. That was fine. They came. My co-worker, also deaf, so we got an interpreter to meet with the two Russians who brought their two sons who are hearing. So their both parents are deaf and the two hearing sons, and there was me, my co-worker who's deaf, and my interpreter. So I would sign, my interpreter would voice, and the one son spoke to the other brother in Russian. And that brother who spoke Russian then signed to the parents in Russian Sign Language. The parents would sign back to that son in Russian Sign Language, and that son spoke Russian to his brother, and that brother then spoke in English to our interpreter who then signed to us. It was a wonderful process, and it worked quite effectively. Both ways. It's a very smooth process. At this time, I'd like to turn the program back over to Mary Mooney. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. As you can see, we have so many things to talk about today, and, and so many ideas have been shared. My mind is already uh, thinking of extra questions that I want to ask. I think that I would like at this time to first of all take, thank everyone for giving me the honor of moderating such a wonderful panel and many of us have had a wonderful few days together and uh, an extraordinary rehearsal process and we've learned off camera and on camera. And I think as we look at you in the audience, we're hoping that we have today with us many potential interpreters who are from color, from Native Americans and Asian Americans. But we also believe that many of you are sitting out there because you are Euro-American and white, and you are part of the interpreting profession, and you've come to learn. And we're here today to share that, again, it's important for us as Euro-American and white interpreters to be part of the diversity process. First of all, the facts are, by 1990, the U.S. Bureau of Census predicts 62 million individuals will be reflective of racial and ethnic diversities as well as other religious backgrounds, sexual orientations. Our world is diverse. And these are the people that we're all going to be providing services to as interpreters. And I strongly believe it's all of our desire to provide the best quality services. Currently, there are 90% of the graduates of interpreter training programs are from Anglo or Euro-American backgrounds. It is estimated about 5% are Hispanic. And in El Paso, which I'd love to say hello to my friends out there, we have a population of about 75% Hispanic students in our program. So it's important that programs start the recruitment process and we begin to locate programs in places where there is a rich population of diversity to draw from. We estimate about 4% are African American black, leaving less than 1% to be reflective of other ethnic and racial minorities. 
This simply is out of balance, as Dr. Anderson said, with what's happening in our country. It creates for us an obvious need. And the obvious need has been addressed by the U.S. Department of Education as recognizing this to be one of the most significant priority needs in the United States at this time. So for some of us, we are aware that there are 10 regional programs. We're here at Waubonsee Community College, which is serving uh, its population in states around the Waubonsee area. But we're also nine other regional programs that are out there. The National Multicultural Interpreting Project was set up to be a support mechanism for all 10 regional projects. We want to assist programs to recruit and more importantly retain uh, individuals from culturally diverse backgrounds. And we want to assist all of us, the perhaps 90% who are Euro-American and, and perhaps even female, to provide the highest quality services possible. Um, the other national project, just for informational purposes, is the Deaf Blind Project at Northwestern Community College in Connecticut. In order to create a project of this magnitude, it was really critical that we involve the leadership. And I think that Dr. Anderson alluded to the fact that we have got representation at the presidential and representational level from the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, from the Conference of Interpreter Trainers. We have the President of Intertribal Deaf Council, uh, representatives from Deaf Asia, which will be, their conference will be next March. We have the President of the National Black Deaf Advocates Association, representatives and chair people from the National Hispanic Council, and also the interpreter and transliterator of color, and another group called NIOBI, the National Alliance of Black Interpreters. We wanted to represent consumers, educators, interpreters, and also the student perspective, because as you are going through a program, and one of the students with us today has said something that we've heard an awful lot across the country, I am an African American student, I am the only person in my class. If you are a student out there who is a member of a minority community, we want you to know that across the nation we're trying to connect with you and to share with your fellow students what we're about. As Dr. Anderson said, we do need specialized curriculum. That iceberg, we've got to explore the 90%. We've got to somehow put it into the textbooks. Because I challenge you out there to look for the word multicultural in our textbooks, in our articles. It is a very rare word to find. When I first came into the field, I was more aware of deaf and hearing. I was aware of English and ASL. But now we know we have multiple languages and multiple communications. We're about to go on break. We want you to know from our national project that we do have a newsletter. It's called In Touch, the National Multicultural Interpreter Project. We'd love to have your name and address so we can send it to you. We want to be in touch during this program. Please call us now over the break. We'd love to hear your personal questions. Thank you, and we'll see you in a very short time. El Paso Community College. We belong to El Paso, and we're doing more for El Paso than ever before. With academic instruction of uncompromising quality, and job skills training in advanced technology, with cultural activities and business opportunities, with continuing education and personal enrichment classes. We're hard at work all over the county, at our three major campuses, and at high schools, churches, community centers, and other locations where thousands of El Pasoans every year find out just how much their own community college can do for them. Our commitment is to excellence in education. Our goal, to provide for every El Pasoan the opportunity to get more out of life through education. We believe education is the key to a brighter future, and our business is to help everyone obtain the preparation and gain the confidence to succeed. Our efforts begin with specially designed continuing education courses, summer camps, and orientation sessions for elementary and middle school age children. We're letting kids know about opportunities for the future and the enjoyment of learning. The Upward Bound program and the Summer Bridge program target high school students with all important math, science, and language instruction, and a taste of college life. If we had an opportunity like Upward Bound when we were in high school, college would have been a lot easier for us and it would have been a lot uh, a lot less challenging and I think a lot more enjoyable and that's exactly what we want for you. 
And for those who don't have time to attend regular classes, the college offers televised courses that meet high academic standards. <laughs> Remember to keep your elbow up. Good, that's it. Oh, and keep yeah. the time of the music we even as you're moving. Older El Pasoans at senior centers all over town enjoy the many activities conducted by the college's senior adult program. That's it. Keep the elbows up nice and high. Keep smiling. Good. Very good. All right. El Paso Community College Literacy Center's outreach program extends literacy and basic skills instruction to every sector of the community. With an eye to the future growth of El Paso, we're targeting areas that will become important trade centers and designing the curriculum for tomorrow. Our international location and special expertise put us on the leading edge in international business education. We're working with Mexico's major technological schools for reciprocal training. New workers in the maquiladora industries, managers new to the border area, and entrepreneurs who want to do new business with Mexico get the customized training they need at El Paso Community College. El Paso Community College is a dynamic and progressive educational institution. We're proving it every day in a thousand ways with educational services that reach out to every part of our community, to new high school graduates, to returning students, international students, working students, and displaced workers, to the disabled, the young and the old. To everyone, this is El Paso Community College. We've made a commitment to excellence, and we belong to you.
Hello and welcome back. We hope you took your break and we do invite you to call in. This is the first time that we can accept live voice calls and we're waiting to hear from you and also to fax us. Uh, your coordinator at your site should have the numbers for you to use. While we're waiting for some calls to come in though, we have had some faxed calls and Dr. Anderson, I would like to uh, share a question that has come in it as how do you choose interpreters that you're going to mentor in the field and perhaps you could address that to African American and black interpreters that need to be mentored in the African American community as well as uh, Caucasian American interpreters. Well first of all <laughs> I'm not in in the area of instructing or teaching interpreters but other black uh, professional interpreters have been mentoring. And of course, they take the time to sit down and talk with interpreters, and I do too, and take the opportunity to encourage their profession, continued professional development. I've seen other black interpreters professionally mentoring. Uh, not, en not enough of that is happening Coda Conference is one place that it happens. It's great to see that. My role is more of uh, supporting, advocating, informing, you know, what resources are available. Caller, go ahead. Yes. Um, this is Job Ayantola call calling through an interpreter from Hartford, Connecticut. I work at Northwestern Community Technical College and I teach in the Deaf Studies program. I have been watching Dr. Glenn Anderson's uh, presentation and he mentioned that the sign for Nigeria was an index finger on the neck. But I was wondering who, who signs it that way? Is it people from other countries in Africa that sign it that way? I was not actually using that as a sign. I was only showing it as an example of the face being used as a map in context. And that was a way that locations could be identified for the different countries within the continent off that profile. Each country does have its own sign that's indigenous to its own country. That was just a purpose of identifying location. It was not meant to be an example of a sign. The examples that I got that from was from that article in the Silent News that I mentioned, March of 1994. And that does include some illustrations, and those examples were there. So, Dr. Anderson, what you're suggesting, again, is that we visit with members of the African community who were born and raised in some of the African countries, and we ask them to share with us some of the indigenous signs. And perhaps, again, one of the projects of the National Multicultural Grant would be to perhaps put more of that on videotape so that we can have a sharing mechanism. Uh, there's another call. Caller, go ahead. Yes, hello. I'm calling from the Wabansi location with actually two questions, if I may. Uh, the first part of it is, how do you choose which interpreters you mentor in the field? And the second is, is it easy for you to know who will adjust to the new cultural situations? If, if you're asking me who to choose which interpreters to mentor, I. I don't, that's not something that I do. Uh, I think that this is basically a voluntary type of process where maybe young interpreters seek out more experienced interpreters and ask those interpreters if they're willing to mentor them. At the NBDA conference, that was how the process worked. They would approach another interpreter and ask, you know, if they would, would you mind observing me, giving me feedback, that sort of thing. But see, now I personally want you to know I do not choose who is to be mentored. Throughout my travels, I have experienced people coming up to me and asking me questions. 
asking me for some advice, and I'm more than willing to, you know, share with anyone who asks me. But this is all, you understand, a volunteer basis. So that kind of brings up two issues, too, the openness to approach people and ask, like, ask for information and advice. And, and I think that what I, a term I've heard sometimes, too, is I, I feel like I'm walking on eggshells. So in how we pose questions, but in an open atmosphere of wanting to learn, then it is important that we call and ask on people. We've got another call waiting. Caller, go ahead. We'll kind of wait for that technical difficulty to come through. But also, I think that if interpreters are out there in their, in their ITPs, National Black Deaf Advocates is an excellent location at the convention level to give uh, African American black interpreters an opportunity to get some conference-based experience and work with some extremely skilled interpreters. I think we have a call waiting. Caller, go ahead. Hello? Go ahead. I'm calling from Gallaudet University. I have several comments and a question I'd like to ask. Um, the first comment is that um, it's wonderful to hear that a multicultural curriculum is being researched and developed. However, um, the caller is, is curious about where the ITPs are in large metropolitan areas that have huge black populations. I'm not sure if there are any specific programs that are set up specifically for black interpreters. There's been some effort, efforts made. I know that uh, there's a college in Alabama, Mississippi, Memphis State has a program. I don't think that there's a program specifically designed for black interpreters. Now, I would like to see more historically black colleges and universities establish ITP programs. I think that'd be an ideal resource, you know, for recruiting more black people into the profession. Thank you for that caller, Gallaudet. We have another call waiting. Caller, go ahead. The other question that um, has been asked is that the, the student is asking why the voice interpreter is not an interpreter of color and wanted to know if you could address the issue of consumer choice and why this wasn't considered in the playing of this program. The other issue this particular participant asks is um, as an only student in a program that um, the caller is disheartened by the lack of role models and staff of color in training programs and asks that you please address that issue as well. Okay, um, Dr. Anderson. All right. We have several interpreters here on set. We do have interpreters of color on the program. I apologize if the voice interpreter is not a person of color. That was not something that was done intentionally. We tried to involve people you know, the best way we can, trying to get the best people we could get who were available at this time. We tried to get a variety of people, and we couldn't get all of them that we wanted. And that's how the arrangements were taken and care of. And I think of. the other part of that question, too, was talking about the lack of role models. And I think, again, that that's, that's a very serious concern that's come up with projects. And one of the processes that we're going to make uh, available is trying to look at some faculty exchange programs, visiting lectures, uh, and also using just people of color and ethnic diversity from our community as role models within the interpreter training program. And I think that's an excellent uh, topic that we will be discussing. Jan, Glenn, uh, Anthony Armborough and, and Jonathan, are you going to be at CIT? And I think this is something we need to bring to everyone's attention. Okay, at this time, uh, it's time for in our program, we would like to ask Fidel Martinez, who is a consumer, is deaf, and has grown up in the Hispanic community to share the Hispanic perspective. Mar Fidel, are you ready? Thank you.
¿Qué pasa? Amigo. There's been a lot of things happening within the Latino deaf community. First, the NHCD for the deaf and hard of hearing represents the National Hispanic Council of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. That was formed just a few years ago and it's a great organization. I never thought I'd ever see this kind of thing happen. I have seen organizations come and go over the years, but this one is still hanging in there. In Chicago, we have an organization. It's a local group called the NCLD, the National Center for Latino Deaf. It works with disabled groups. It's a, that bothers me a little bit because of the development De de delayed individuals that are involved, but I'm very impressed with the group, nevertheless, the NCLD, because they're concerned about why some deaf students, high school students, will come to that organization with very poor grades, very poor educational le levels, like 2.3 or so, and people are stereotyping, saying that well, that's very typical of deaf people. And say, hey, that's not true. I know that's not true. That's wrong. They didn't get the appropriate education. That's the problem. And you're having to work with parents as well on this. Really, both organizations were founded to improve the uh, value of the deaf and hard of hearing, the, the cultural, the culture uh, of, these, of these groups and deal with the communication problems. They're involved with children and parents as well as professional people. It's a very good group of people working in the, both the organizations. I remember myself when I had a dream. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a matador a bullfighter. I even would draw pictures as a young person of the bullfighters. And I dreamed of Mexico a lot. That was part of my culture. Now, the problem with the term, say, Hispanic, some people don't like that term. They think it's more of a sophisticated, professional, that doesn't really bother me, but I'm listening and I'm open to what people are saying. A number of people I've noticed are more uh, favor the term Latino. It's more or less used among the grassroots people. It makes me laugh. Just a few years ago, I went to the National Hispanic Deaf Conference. And uh, oh, a deaf woman herself, a Hispanic, got up and said, Hispanic, what's with that? Why do we have a male-dominated world? Why not her Hispanic? Ah, I love that. It's really funny. You know, you have to remember the, the women, the part, that part of our culture. And then what about the term Chicano? I'm, I'm one of them, yes. That refers to Mexican-American, and that term very popular in the southwestern part of the United States, like Southern California, where they had the revolts against uh, the Lettuce Union. That really refers more or less to the Mexican-American. Now let's talk about me. Who am I? I was born here in Chicago. It's my kind of town, right? Chicago. I was kind of surprised. They say, you know, poor people can't uh, be successful, minorities can't succeed, but we can. And I realized that I could, and I, I was able to learn that through role models, appropriate education, and a number of different factors. I didn't start out with a good educational foundation. There was some difficulty, my mother being hearing, 
my dad also. We came from a very famous landmark in Chicago called Max Maxwell Street. It's also known for uh, uh, as a Jewish area, Jewtown. I, I was raised in that area. Now it's it's been uh, redeveloped. My mom, when uh, I think she drops left school and dropped out in third grade, she didn't know exactly what to do with me. She sent me to a Catholic school. You know, Hispanic people are very strong in the Catholic religion and wanted me to learn that. So I was put in that school. It was a public school, a hearing school. I didn't do well. I was quite hyperactive. And a lot of the hearing people and the professionals there, you know, didn't really understand deaf people. And so then my mother went to see a doctor and social workers and other professionals. And then I was labeled as mental retard retarded. So I was put into that program, program for mentally retarded children. So it was institutional. I was there for three years, as I recall, the winter storms and the changing the season. I remember that over a period of three years. I was approximately six, seven, and eight. I was a very young child. I didn't understand. I saw a lot of different life experiences there. and I thought life was easy there, you know. Didn't really have to do anything, didn't learn anything, didn't have to worry about taxes or anything. You know, I had no responsibilities as a child. Somehow my mom uh, figured that something was wrong and decided that uh, I needed to go to a better school. And what, uh, what happened was that my mother met a deaf man at work. My mother was working in a factory, earning a very low wage at that time. You know. The women always are paid less. This is a historical fact. And she asked this deaf man that uh, you, you went to a college somewhere in D.C. and so forth, and she began to have higher hopes for me, for her Fidel, that I would do well. And she kept asking this man about where he went to school and so forth, and found that there was a, a school in Chicago, a Catholic school, used ASL. I learned a lot from that program. That school, actually, though, that program went bankrupt. It's really odd because the archdiocese in Chicago had established a number of oral programs, and they all remained very successful and strong. And this one, they, they closed, and they said it was because of bankrupt. And it was one of the best programs using ASL, though. So I went over to an oral program. I didn't succeed very well, so then I went to a school for the deaf in Cincinnati, Ohio, a good school. But I felt part of the problem with that school at the time was a lack of uh, role models for me. I'm speaking of professional deaf people. They were all hearing professionals there. And I, there was no deaf adults to learn from. And I learned that deaf people couldn't. And I even said that myself, deaf people can't do things. I worked for 20 years and learned about life. And really didn't have a lot of goal and my dream to be a matador was gone because it wasn't realistic. I, I learned from life. I learned to, you know, just eat, work, and sleep. My family, you know, was a tradition about work, a strong work ethic. Also, my mother, being born in Illinois, and my father was born in Mexico, my mother's grandparents came from Mexico. They left Mexico because of the revolution that was going on with Pancho Villa. So uh, they lived in a number of parts of America and finally settled in Illinois. My brother also is deaf, two years older than myself. He's actually uh, a sports figure. He loves sports. He's a great fan. Uh, we have different interests in that area. Within the family, I, a, a great influence upon me was music. I love music today. My uncle used to take me out to uh, different performances. And then one day, he asked me to be involved with a big production for the Latino 
concert. I was with all these hearing people. It was a professional concert, and they spoke English, but the idea was it sounded uh, you know, kind of like cheap, you know, doing cheap work for a big event, you know, but nevertheless, it was very impressive, and I did it. I was very impressed with that organization called Latin Explosion. Actually, it's a wonderful organization. They gave me the opportunity to be involved with the Hearing Hispanic group. I'm married, no children. Been married 26 years. My wife was born in Puerto Rico. And she's profoundly deaf. Maybe between severe and profoundly deaf. She uses hearing aids both ears. She loves music. That's why I married that woman, because uh, we shared a lot of cultural uh, commonalities. Before getting married, I went through hell, so to speak. I had to go through, uh, like, the shotgun situation, you know, her father. Uh, he was really a pain in the neck. I, I really didn't like him at all. Found out that he hated Mexicans. I said, oh, man. I had done nothing wrong to him personally. I was taking good care of her. I was just taking her out. But uh, he was very stubborn. He wouldn't even come to our wedding. It was a very difficult uh, man, a very high egotistical, highly egotistical man. Her parents got divorced, and, uh, you know, I learned something from that. Now, my mother also warned me, don't marry a Puerto Rican woman. And I thought, why? They only cook chicken and rice, she told me. What a puzzling statement, you know. When I met Iris, it was very different than what I'd been told. She was great. She was a, she's really an American girl. She wasn't really focused on the Hispanic culture. We, were, we dated each other for five years before we got married. We've had a wonderful 26 years of uh, married life. Oh, yes, another thing about music. We started a, a group, a musical group, it's really part of the dancing. And uh, I guess maybe we're one of the first in the Chicago area to establish the mixture of black, Hispanic, and deaf, with a few Caucasians. And we blended them in uh, like a melting plot as a group. But it was a great show. We did an African cultural dance. People had never really observed that before. My, my wife's a great designer. And we, we educated the deaf community, and not just focusing on the hearing. And we, we received a number of invitations from different deaf groups to perform. We're not the rock and roll type of performers. It's more of an art reflecting the culture. It's educational, helping people to, you know, especially the deaf community, to learn about the African and Spanish Latino cultural connections. It's very important to understand the culture of a person. I remember working at a high school mainstream program in Chicago. And one day I met a deaf man, graduate of Gallaudet University. I said, Fidel, looks like this deaf person's looking for, a student's looking for trouble. He's got this wooden stick in his back pocket. And maybe he's going to attack somebody. Maybe he's part of a gang. Maybe he's involved in that kind of activity. I said, Hmm, really? And this guy looked kind of like a, maybe he'd be a member of a gang. You know, he had that macho look. He had that mixture of black, Chicano, uh, Latino. You know, I don't know who, who, which came first, but the deaf teacher says, see, see that stick in his back pocket? And I said, wait a minute. That stick is a, a musical instrument used in Spanish. It's called a clave was developed by Afro-Cuban uh, music musicians there in Cuba. It became very popular and spread throughout, uh, you know, the pop music and so forth. 
Another part of the culture people need to understand, it's very well known. You know, you may have heard that America uses like the sweet 16 uh, birthday for the, you know, the young girls, they get all dressed up. It's almost like a formal wedding party. That's for their 16th birthday in Spain, or in Spanish community, especially in the South American area. They have that kind of thing, and I think it was started there. But it's at 15 years of age. And it's a big, uh, formal, very involved kind of ceremony and party. About four years ago, there was a girl from Ecuador here in the Chicago area, had a deaf fam is of a deaf family with a hearing child. And they hosted that kind of party. One time, a chaplain for deaf people tried to uh, almost like bless them, you know, the deaf hearing, the deaf girl, the Spanish, uh, Mexican had this part and they suddenly the girl started crying. She was afraid. There was confusion there and the, the uh, chaplain said, hold on here, started talking with her and found out that the girl didn't know what was going on. Why? You know, I don't want to get married. Nobody's told me what's going on here. I'm for, I don't even know this person. I don't want to be forced to, to marry. Well, there was a communication breakdown there. The family should have explained it to her. Gang activities. I've seen a lot of gangs when I was young. I was never forced to join, but I kind of felt trapped within that neighborhood. I learned, uh, you know, illegal and improper activity. It's an ongoing situation. The gangs have a sign like this, for example. They actually sign it this way, downward. And if you use that sign, the gangs have, as I say, their own signs and symbols. If they see you using that, for example, you, they'll shoot you just for nothing. They're called gang bangers. It, just for nothing, they'll shoot you. Like a policeman as well, they give deaf people a hard time too. Let's talk about interpreting services. There's a great demand for trilingual interpreters for the deaf community. My experience is with a number of interpreters having to speak in uh, Spanish, not necessarily if you say, I want a black interpreter or a Hispanic interpreter. What we need is a very skilled interpreter. That's what helps to uh, produce effective communication. So I've seen that situation a number of times. CODA, children of deaf adults. I see many deaf people who come with their cho hearing children who sign very professionally doesn't mean they're qualified because sometimes they're not really interested in interpreting, but many codas I notice don't know, you know, much about the process. You know, but you see that happening a lot in minority groups, especially the Spanish speaking community. Hispanic organizations, I would advise interpreters to get a hold of the National Hispanic Organizations, Organization for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. They can help you in areas of communication needs. In terms of role models are very important. I saw, for example, Robert de Villa as the first Hispanic role model for me. He uh, worked at Gallaudet and moved up the ranks ended up being undersecretary, assistant undersecretary in education, and, and he, uh, you know, he never stops. He's a great success. He, he, he moved, uh, expanded the horizons that we can achieve. The National Association of the Deaf, I'm very happy to hear, but what I've read about is that they're finally open, inviting Hispanic deaf man by the name of Mark Akoda. He's a Latino, the first one to break what you call the Hispanic uh, race barrier. 
for the deaf, a deaf Latino. And it's good. It makes everybody look good. It's very important. The attitude. The attitude is very important. You know, you may share uh, deafness with somebody, but they may not have a good attitude. Or maybe they're a good interpreter, maybe they're not. You can tell by their attitude, and that's wrong to have a bad attitude. Now I'd like to say, this is not so long. This is adios. Okay, thank you, Fidel. We appreciate that. And I was thinking as we open dialogues, stories are really how we develop the themes of what the curriculum and what the next steps of our processes are going to be. Uh, it seemed like the theme of, of learning a culture superficially came up of where deaf people live in a culture but without true communication access through the deaf community and through interpreter services, they may have only a superficial attitude. Uh, you brought up the issue of CODAs, that is using children of deaf adults who may have, again, a rich cultural heritage that we can also bring into the field. And again, the idea that some of us have that when we have just we hear that term Hispanic and we think of one group of people and what you're sharing with us is that the Mexican American community, the Puerto Rican community, the Dominican Republic community, the Haitian community, and the Mexican American community have some shared values and systems, but also we can't prejudge that if you're Puerto Rican you have an exact same background as a person from Mexico. And of course living on the border, uh, for us in the El Paso border area, that's a very common uh, thought. Uh, panel, I think it's time for us to have some discussions on some of the themes that we've been brought up. Um, Jan, talk to us again about, I, sometimes people want to say that if I'm Euro-American, I can only then interpret in Euro-American situations. Is that really what's happening in the Washington, D.C. area? And also, again, from an Asian-American perspective, do we want to say that if you're Asian-American, then you can be the only one to go into an Asian-American situation? Well, that's a hard question, but I think that was a theme that one of our callers was talking about. I'm going to ask the question to the two of you. Let me make a statement. I don't think there are enough interpreters out there around the world to specialize and only interpret in one particular area. I'm an Asian American. Sometimes I work with people of a different culture. And if there's a clash, I can't serve them well. Sometimes a person who's an Asian, sometimes we'll get along and that's fine. But sometimes, you know, it doesn't matter. Sometimes we're both Asians. And there's a conflict there and we don't get along. My feeling about interpreting It would be a question of service. And when it's time for me to pick someone, I want to pick someone I'm confident in, that I know they're very competent, that I have complete trust in. Race is not my first thought. My first question is, are they competent? Do, the, do I feel they're trustworthy? Can I relate with them? Now, in some situations, it's very important in terms of being the same race or same ethnic, ethnic background. But I think it's very important for all of us to be sensitive to everyone. I don't think we should be limiting ourselves, expecting that we're going to interpret only for people that have the same background and race that we have. I think you make a good point because, again, as we have the hearing and deaf consumer, we have two sets of consumers. It's very unlikely that we'll ever be reflective of identical cultural qualities on both uh, consumer point of view. Jonathan, you have a lot of uh, diversity that comes up at the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. Again, how does those departments handle those kind of like, it's Hispanic Month right now, it's going to be uh, Black History Month in February. Uh, what are some of the planning considerations? Well, it's interesting because there are not that there are not that many minority interpreters 
in uh, at the college where I work at, and the uh, the minority population for the deaf and for the hearing is growing because of the demographics. And in regards to having an interpreter match the same ethnic background, um, that's almost impossible. Um, and because uh, my, myself being Native American and only knowing three other Native American people who are interpreters, uh, it's going to be difficult to find that many Native American interpreters to interpret all the Native American events that go on. So I think that uh, often what we do is we bring in, and I know I do, uh, bring in people who are not members of that ethnic group and mentor them um, and tutor them and team assignments with them so they can get comfortable interpreting in those situations. And hopefully, it, um, like this multicultural grant program is, they're being trained um, and um, tutored, mentored, and educated about these different ethnic groups and these different uh, minority groups that we serve because um, obviously there aren't enough interpreters and translators of color right now. So what we do is we bring in people who are not interpreters and translators of color and mentor and train them to go into those groups. It was interesting, too, in El Paso, since we've had so many of this leadership team come into El Paso, it's been uh, something will happen like Will Yaska, who was the uh, president of Intertribal Deaf Council, came to El Paso. And it happened that one of our local interpreters provided him an extra liaison service. We took him around the community, went into Mexico. And as a result of establishing rapport, that specific interpreter was then invited to come to Intertribal Deaf Council and interpret. So I think that it seems that we're also saying, number one, those human qualities of rapport building and openness and respect seem to be uh, very primary. And the second is those respect issues. So, and high quality skills. I don't think any interpreter that we recruit of color then wants to be only interpreting in Black History Month, for example. But here we have a chance that I might get, I might love to interpret in Black History Month, but want to have a mentoring partner to take, go with me and make me feel comfortable in that experience. And then I would have an opportunity to grow. And consumers would see, again, a partnership, an African American interpreter, a Euro American interpreter working together. So I think, I think you, talked about some very important things until the numbers change. Fidel? Yes, I'd like to emphasize a problem with the school system where deaf children learn signs, you know, from the teacher, which is like an English sign language. And people of all color, you know, learn this type of signing. And then when they go into the high school years, there's no interpreter there. They're either deaf teachers or, but when there is an interpreter, they're using ASL, and these children don't know what it is. I've seen that happen many times. They don't understand their own language because the teachers in elementary school are using that English sign language or a gesture, and I tell them to you know to use the gestures till they can understand to bridge that that area. Another issue too that, that just coming from. Uh the border and the Mexican-American experience is that a lot of people assume that there is something called Spanish Sign Language. And when we went to Boston and the National Hispanic Council, uh, one of the things that really came up is there is truly a Mexican Sign Language as used by the indigenous people from who are Mexican nationals coming into the United States. There is a version of American Sign Language used in Puerto Rico, very similar. and, and fairly mutually understandable, but there is Guatemalan, Honduran, and Haitian versions of, of sign language too. So I think what we're going to be developing through our process of dialogue is making sure that we're speaking correctly and requesting the proper kinds of interpreters. So for example, if you call in El Paso and you say you need a Spanish sign language interpreter, you really have to be specific. Do you really want a Mexican sign language? Do you want ASL? Do you want Spanish on the mouth, ASL on the hands? Or, you know, and we're also using a, a vast number of deaf intermediary interpreters. And again, that's an area that perhaps today we won't fully explore, but the use of a deaf person who has a cultural background from two or more uh, backgrounds teaming again with us as interpreters to make a fuller and more complete service provision. Um, Dr. Anderson, again, do you think there are some situations so specific and so specialized that again the absolute match of race and gender um, maybe even sexual orientation issues becomes absolutely critical to the success of that assignment? Oh, yes. <coughs> so 
You know, I think right off the bat, the uh, black church, for example, I think it'd be very difficult for a person not of the culture to be comfortable interpreting in a black church. There are other kinds of situations where it's very important that that person share the same cultural background. But coming back to what uh, Jan was saying and Jonathan about what's an important criteria when you're looking for an interpreter, I agree with them. Naturally, the first is competence and then feeling that you can trust them. And of course, this is going to depend on what's the interpreting situation that you're looking at. I prefer a black interpreter if, say, it's a black church setting, if it's a very uh, pro dominantly or prominent black speaker, I would prefer a black interpreter. It depends on the situation, sure. So again, we can't prejudge situations. We have to have full knowledge and background. We're looking for rapport. We're looking for trust building, and we're looking for, again, a community of interpreters in which there's a place for everyone's skills and opportunity to enhance and grow at every level, which brings us to a perfect place uh, to introduce our next presenter this afternoon, Jan Nishimura. And while Jan's uh, getting into her, her place, I want to share that Jan Nishimura and Jonathan are functioning on the National Multicultural Interpreting Project as team leaders. Also is Anthony Aramburo, representing African-American black interpreters, and Angela Roth from the Hispanic community. So Jan uh, will be speaking to us on some of the characteristics of the Asian deaf community and values. Good afternoon. It is not only an honor to have been invited to participate on this panel. It is a thrill. I have experienced an excitement in doing the research and the dialoguing and the network for this project, going through a process of self-discovery, this serving as the impetus and the catalyst for putting together the different parts of my personality and my life, which have heretofore been compartmentalized. I have, up until a couple of years ago, had some very neat distinctions in my life. There was home, I'm a third generation Japanese American, Sansei, and the Japanese church and the Japanese community. That was one community. Then there was the community that I went to, which is the mainstream school, other friends. And then I discovered this other community, deaf people and American Sign Language. Wow, out of sight. Because the deaf community and what I saw there allowed me to develop a part of my personality and behaviors that were not encouraged in other parts of my life. So I have, for a long time, always felt that the deaf community part, my professional work as an interpreter, and my home life, the intrinsic inherent values that I didn't even know existed, were separate and distinct. And in the last several months, I've come to realize that I've come to accept in harmony the existence of these parts of my life and to be able to see myself more as an integrated whole as opposed to living the life of an interpreter in confidentiality and shh, don't tell them where I'm going, you know. So I have to thank you for this opportunity. It's been a learning experience and something that I'm looking forward to future education, future growth, future dialoguing. In fact, a lot of what I'm doing now is so totally contrary to what is part of the Asian culture that I have to think twice about how I want to present it or how I want to, um, how I want to think it through. I have to give special thanks to the other Asian interpreters and members of the Asian deaf community who are willing to share with me and to think through and to come to a realization of our own commonalities and what our values are, because sometimes these values and these behaviors are not articulated, especially when you talk about an Asian American community, people who are born in this country, Asians who are born in this country, what we have is a culture which is now mixed with a Western culture or an American culture. 
So I never know which parts of me are Japanese. This is the Japanese part of me. Nope, this is the Chicago part of me. I'm a native Chicagoan. Nope, this is the deaf part of me. So I think that's true for all of us, though, that we all carry within us different kinds of cultures. So I don't think we can attribute any one behavior to any one culture. OK, task at hand. When we talk about the Asian population, who are we talking about? The United States government recognizes 34 countries and 500 languages as being part of Asia. The figures are just to give you an idea, a comparison. The Chinese and Japanese began immigrating to the US back in the 1880s. So you will see many Chinese and Japanese who are American born, second, third, and fourth generations. If I also teach in an interpreter education program. And invariably, every semester, I get at least one student who says, where are you from? And I say, Chicago. No, where are you really from? And I say, Chicago. Or I have someone says to me, you speak English really well. Thank you. How long have you been speaking English? So there's an assumption on the part of the non-Asian interpreters that I am not from this country. Right? Now, I have to put everything into a cultural context. When I go into a store and I notice it's a Korean shopkeeper, and they say, where are you from? I will answer, I'm a third generation Japanese American. It's a cultural thing. But it's, I realize that from them, it's an expectation. The other part of this question that often gets me into trouble is when I meet other Japanese people who look at me and say, well, gee, you look Japanese. You should be able to speak it. My mother used to say that my accent is so bad, I could only speak to deaf Japanese because my accent's wrong. So I tell people that I'm like the Honda, a Honda Accord. The um, materials and the parts are from Japan, but the labor and production was made in the USA. So when you meet an Asian, you have to be careful about how you stereotype and how you see these people. You look, if you look at the percentages, in the Japanese community, only 33% of the population in the US was born in Japan. If you look at all of the other communities, the greater percentage of those communities were born in other countries. Reasons for immigration are either that of looking for better opportunities, looking for a better education. Some may be refugees. We're seeing that in the 1970s, after the Vietnam um, era, we see a great influx of people from Southeast Asia. I don't believe there are demographics as to the number of deaf Asians, deaf Asian Americans. I think that one would have to look at the population as a whole. In general, there is computed to the Asian population comprises about 2.9% of the population. So one could extrapolate and say, what are the figures based on the entire population? Also, when you look at a person from Asia, you have to also look at where they were born, but the amount of acculturation and assimilation that those people have gone through. What was their reason for coming to the US? How long have they lived in the US? What are the factors are influencing them? Because each one will have a different will be a different factor in how you approach those people. And because they're coming to the US and they see the US as being a better life, the Asian traditions, traditions may not be something that they want to keep. I know that for myself, because I was born in the era after World War II and the Japanese Americans were interned, I was never, I never realized which parts were Japanese. I was never really encouraged to go to Japanese school. I don't have the language. I know how to say there's a pencil under the desk. I can sort of figure out what people are saying by listening to them. But I don't have as much of the culture as I wish I, I did have. The emphasis was, you do it the American way. But I really wasn't sure what the American way was. Consequently, most of my life, I've spent trying to figure out which part is which.
in order to understand the Asian people, the behaviors, we need to look at the belief systems that exist in the Asian countries. Major religions or philosophies, very influential is that of Confucianism. Confucius talked about the relationships between people and how we are to treat each other. He espoused humanity, courtesy, kindness, compassion, charity, diligence, respect. He also emphasized filial piety. He emphasized respect for the family. He talked about status and traditions. Responsibilities to relationships was also important. How I, how I interact with somebody. He also espoused loyalty. Loyalty to yourself, loyalty to whatever you're doing, and reciprocity. What is done or given to me, I must return at least in equal value, if not more. I now understand why my Sansei girlfriend and I tried to outdo each other in, high, in college. When after we were working, I'd take her out for dinner. No, 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 let me take you out. No, I'll take you out. No, I'll take you out. And I used to hate this feeling of now I owe you one. And doing the research, that explains it. Second belief system is Buddha, Buddhism. Buddhism talks about three noble truths. I'm giving you a summary of the religions. They're much more in depth and much more subtle than what I could present here. Buddhism talks about suffering, life equated to suffering, and that suffering is constant. That the only way that one can see suffering is by, that rather suffering is caused by desire. And the only way to cease suffering is to eradicate desire, to eradicate greed. Next, philosophical system and later became a religion was Taoism, which talked about man's relationship with nature. Therein you find the principle of yin, yin and yang. You find the idea of fatalism, that it was meant to happen, that there is a fate. I don't have control over what's going to happen. Shintoism, respect for your elders, hero worship, respect for nature, that there are spirits that exist, Similarly, animism also talks about every object as having a spirit. Now, how does this translate in terms of values? Major value is harmony. Maintaining harmony within yourself, with others, and with nature. One of the sayings I remember is that of when you see a flower, do you pluck it or do you leave it? You should leave it. That when, in, so as to be harmonious with other people, you think of the other person's feelings and you react to that person. You do not want to embarrass that person. There is a great sense of hospitality anticipating the needs and the wants of that person. I don't want the other person to feel bad, so I do not express my own feelings or my own wants. I avoid conflict. I do not challenge what you say. We talk about safe subjects. We talk about subjects on a superficial level because I don't want to hurt your feelings. And if you inadvertently hurt my feelings, I have to hide that because I don't want, ma I don't want to make you feel bad. Communication is indirect. Never is something said outright. When my youngest sister was about 10 years old, she asked my mother if she could get her ears pierced. And my mother didn't say anything. My sister got her ears pierced. My mother was surprised. Asians have a tendency to understatement. That's an example. My mother was surprised. <laughs> my mother was more than surprised. <laughs> and my sister said, well, mom, you didn't say I could. You didn't say I couldn't. And my mother said, but I didn't say you could. So silence is an indication of acceptance of I hear you, 
but not an indication of, I agree with you. Silence is used as, give me time to think about all the factors that are involved in whatever it is I'm faced with. There is an external locus of control, wanting to please other people. Second major value is the importance of the group over the individual. The group can be the family, in fact, family is the first group, or it can be where you work. It can be the sports team. But the group is more important than the individual. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, so says Spock. And in so doing, because the needs of the many are more important than my needs, then what that translates to is, I am nothing. It's the group that's important. It was very difficult for me to adjust the idea that a person could claim success. I'm the one who made this project happen. It was my idea. I did it. When it was actually a group of people who worked on it, and whereas I would want to give credence to the group and credit to the group, I would often see as an accepted part of culture the one person being the spokesperson for the group as getting the credit. Because there's a great need for um, value for the group, there's also a sense of conformity. We have to do as the group wants. There's very little opportunity, need for individuality. In American culture, the idea is, or the philosophy that's espoused is, be yourself. In Asian culture, the philosophy is, behave well. Do not be an embarrassment to me, my mother often said. I commented about the idea of understatement as being a characteristic of Asian culture, nonverbal communication being very important, and humility. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. So if a person says, well, I'm not really very good at that, it probably means they're outstanding in that skill. But one never knows. One Asian, when talking to another Asian, knows that that is a characteristic of the, that, of the culture, so may be open to interpretation. A, a person who is non-Asian listening to that statement may really think that person can't do it. Respect for age and status. Elderly, having more status than the younger. Males, more status than females. You see the importance of status when you see two Asians, when they meet each other. As an Asian, I relate to you on the basis of where, how we relate to each other and the whole social sphere of things. So if we exchange business cards, if you've ever seen two Asians exchange business cards, there is a very quick acknowledgement. What's your status? What's my status? OK, you're more important than I am. I have to bow lower than you do. But it all happens in about three minutes. Within the idea of status, you also see certain professions as having greater status than others. Achievement in the profession and education is another very uh, important value. Because um, achievement brings honor and dignity to the family name. It brings honor and dignity to your ethnic race. To be not success successful is to bring shame and to lose face within the community. Family, I talked about the family as being the first social group, being very cohesive. Children often live with parents until they get married. The elderly often come back and live with their adult children. That there is a, again, within the parents and the children, an indirect kind of communication. Never did I get, oh, wow, you did a good job. It was more, oh, I will give you more to do. The inference being, you did a good job, therefore I'm going to give you more. When you see Asian families moving to the US, Asian, uh, the family cohesion becomes very important because it's instrumental to the economic survival of the family, particularly if that family is involved in um, a private business, a small business, a, a shopkeeper, dry cleaners, or whatever um, ent entrepreneurial effort that family is engaged in. Disabilities as seen by the Asians, is a loss of face. It is an embarrassment. It's something to be ashamed of. So it's something that you didn't talk about. It's something you hid. 
And very often that disability happened because you did something wrong way back or your ancestors did something wrong. So in addition to the idea of honor, shame, you also have the idea of guilt. I wonder what I did that caused this child to be deaf. Traditional Asian or stereotyped Asian behaviors that you'll see. I don't want to ruffle the waters. So the, the qualities of patience and gentleness, being calm, reserved. And how this translates into the interpreting field is, in my own discovery, I had to recognize that as an interpreter, I had to do things that were antithetical to what I would do in my natural life. So if I have to negotiate and be assertive for logistics, where I'm going to stand or how I'm going to do business, I, I have to work very hard at how I present myself. I also had to work hard at accepting the idea of debate teams, that people argue for the sake of arguing. I never argue for the sake of arguing. It's, that does not keep peace. When you see an Asian person within a group, you see that person as being self-controlled, self-disciplined, hard worker, supportive of the group, and loyal to that group. I think that Asians are often called the model minority. We're often called the silent minority because the tendency with us is to think first and then speak. I think that the effects of the Asian personality, Asian values and culture, as it affects life and affects our interaction, are very subtle because they're so, um, they're subtle and they're intermixed with other cultural values out of the deaf community, values of language and ASL. I hope I've whetted your appetite and uh, made you interested in learning more. I believe it's time for a break. I think it's a wonderful time to call in with your questions. We'll see you later. I'm John Swalick, president of Wabansi Community College. Just a little over a quarter century ago, Wabansi Community College embarked upon its mission to provide educational opportunities to better prepare 